Hi, I'm Sarah Weiler from Contemporary Education, and today I want to talk about a very important concept in education. It's the concept of agency and how we develop students' agency in schools depends on how we understand the concept of agency. First of all, it's important to think about what is agency? What does that mean to you when you hear the word agency? And some possible ideas could be that agency has to do with authority. It has to do with liberty or freedom, choice making, decision making, authorship, intentionality, judgment, free will, and so on and so forth. I chose a couple of citations from a group of Finnish educators that I thought give us a general tone of the concept agency. So Hainio 2010 writes that on a very general level, agency refers to human beings' capacity to impact and eventually transform their life circumstances and practices in which they're engaged. And I've highlighted transform. So agency is often associated with action that is transformative, giving human beings this sense of authority and control over their actions to transform their lives and the world around them. Lipponen and Kupilainen, 2011, write, agency can be defined as the capacity to initiate purposeful action that implies will, autonomy, freedom, and choice. So once again, the idea or almost synonymous idea of agency with freedom, agency with will, and this idea of being able to make choices and make decisions. Now, agency in education is often a response to reducing action to following orders or prescriptions. So the teacher, for instance, being the issuer of orders and prescriptions for how things should be done and students being the passive recipients and often expected to blindly obey the teacher's orders and in terms of learning, often repeat or reproduce the prescriptions of the teacher for what should be thought, how things should be done, and therefore creating a sense of alienation from uh, the content of the curriculum that they're learning, something that's fragmented and cut off from the lives that they lead and the real life choices and decisions that they make, as well as this sense of acting out of habit that has not been reflected and uh, in kind of enculturation of seeing and observing how people act and what people think and then reproducing that, thinking that that is the only way to think or act. So that can make a kind of mechanical or automatic thought and action process rather than something that's been critically reflected upon and understanding where a thought or an action comes from and its consequences and implications to be able to then state a thought or a belief and take an action uh, responsibly and being held accountable for one's thoughts and actions by others. This concept of student agency um, has been around for a few years, so much so that the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, um, which just as a sidebar, um, that's the organization that produces the PISA exam. That's an international benchmarking exam that's often used to rate the quality of countries' educational systems, wrote a report in 2019 called Student Agency for 2030 that defines student agency as the capacity to set a goal, reflect, and act responsibly to affect change. And I put this here as a way of understanding that student agency is a concept that is being looked at internationally. However, it's a concept that's still not very well developed or understood in many educational settings. Now, like I said, this part one, we'll discuss more of the philosophical foundations of the concept agency. It'll go into agency in terms of um, other concepts that carry a similar meaning 
or that have been built upon to the, the idea of agency that we have today from other concepts in the past, such as like formerly mentioned concepts of freedom, liberty, free will, and autonomy. So let's dig into the philosophical foundations of the concept of agency. From the Enlightenment, authors such as Locke, Smith, Bentham, and Mill are cited by the sociologists Emmis Bayer and Misch, 1998, stating that a new conception of agency emerged that affirmed the capacity of human beings to shape the circumstances in which they live. And they say that in this conception of agency, it's embedded within an individualist and calculative conception of action. So if you look at these authors such as Bentham, is associated with a more utilitarianist view. And it also goes to Mill, who makes the argument that as long as I'm not harming anyone else, my independence is of right, absolute over himself, over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign. So these authors take the position towards agency that the individual should have the power and the authority and the control over their own decision making, the possibility of making choices without interference or intervention of others that it's like it says here, a very individualist view. As long as I'm not harming anyone else, my right is absolute. So it's focusing on who makes the decision, who takes the action. Now we can contrast this to Kantian conception of autonomy and Hegelian conception of self-determination such that they shift the focus from who's making the decision or the choice or taking the action to what's the content of the decision of the choice and the action? What's its meaning? What are the reasons for making a judgment and how those reasons uh, sustain and constitute beliefs or concepts, conceptual meaning? So Kant argues that freedom in thinking means the subjection of reason under no other laws than those gives itself. So laws or rules constitute meaning, and then I choose those rules that I bind myself to in judgment or in action as an individual, and that's an expression of my autonomy or my agency. So let's take an example. If I say I'm committed to environmental sustainability and then my actions should be a reflection of that, my actions should be um, something that I'm held accountable for, held responsible for in light of the fact that I've, I've stated this claim that I bind myself to this concept of sustainability and whatever are the rules that I believe govern what sustainability is. Now for Kant, those rules are determined prior to the application of the concept or prior to action. Um, so there's kind of universal principles that we'll arrive at and then everybody should apply those in the particulars of each judgment or each application of a concept. Hegel replaces Kant's individualist model with a social one. He argues that the authority to make oneself responsible for what one thinks and what one does makes sense only in the context in which one can be held responsible. And he discusses that in terms of reciprocal recognition, that is by individuals practically taking or treating one another as authoritative and so responsible. This comes from Robert Brandom and his interpretation of Hegel's work. This is something that differs in terms of noting from who has the authority in decision-making or the agency to what has authority in terms of 
your reasons for acting one way or another. So Brandom discusses this as self-determination that could be understood as the transformative and emancipatory power with reason in its critical function. The only authority it admits as legitimate and legitimating is the authority of the better reason. That particular normative force compelling only to the rational, and that this emancipation is the replacement of a traditional model of authority that's based on the obedience to a superior or being subordinate to a superior in terms of who sets the rules and enforces the rules to the model of autonomy in which authority is based on reasons. So it's about what is the content of the rules and why are, are these reasons important? Or as Brandom says, the legitimate and legitimating authority of the better reason. So these two ideas of agency I have discussed in my work in terms of agency as non-intervention. So this goes back to Locke, Smith, Bentham, and Mill thinking about the idea that there should be an ethos of non-imposition of rules as limits, obstacles, or barriers upon human beings' action in the world. And this view of agency as self-determination coming from Hegel and Brandom's interpretation of Hegel's work as the idea that people bind themselves to rules as conceptually based reasons in judgment or action to which they're held responsible by others. And when you think about agency and education, thinking about meaning and concepts and how those play out in actions and judgment, this is something that directly relates to the, the content of school curriculums, how we understand concepts, and then how we relate those concepts to our real-life decision-making. Now, Berlin, just briefly, Isaiah Berlin, 1969, also talks about the, this differentiation that I've just made as agency as non-intervention and agency as self-determination. He discusses in terms of negative liberty and positive liberty. And he says negative liberty is the area within which the subject, a person or group of persons, is or should be left to do or be what he is able to do or be without interference by others. So keyword interference. Whereas positive liberty centers on meaning and meaning making to act with deliberation towards the realization of one's fundamental purposes. So Berlin says, what or who is the source of control or interference that can determine someone to do or be this rather than that? Now, finally, along these same lines, I wanted to bring in Backhurst, 2011, because he talks about the difference between rational and non-rational determinations, um, which I kind of made reference to when I talked about how um, in education we're talking about agency as a response to enculturation and these unreflected habits and routines or mechanistic action, routinized actions. So Backhurst he captures this, the idea of freedom as endorsing our reasons, we make them our own, for which we must take responsibility. In the Kantian framework, if reflection is portrayed as liberating us from something, it's not by the domination of reasons, but the domination of thought and action by non-rational determination or even the hold of dogma. That comes from McDowell. But this idea of non-rational determination where we're acting without reflection, we're doing things in a kind of routinized and mechanistic way based on perhaps what we see around us, a kind of repetition or reproduction of what the examples that we have of both thought and action around us, but without reflecting on it and understanding what are the reasons that underscore, underlie those actions and those beliefs. This also uh, leads to McDowell's argument that we can be unreflectively immersed 
you know, within the culture that we live in so that we don't even see that we have other possibilities of action, other possibilities of thought or beliefs, other rules that we could bind ourselves to and commit ourselves to that we can take greater responsibility for because we understand what they follow from and what follows from them. So I give this example of thinking about the rule when you play a game to take turns. Um, does this rule have authority beyond who establishes and enforces it? Because the teacher could say, for example, okay, guys, you need to take turns, but what about the actual authority of the rule, the content of the rule? What are the reasons for or against taking turns? In other words, why take turns? So this relates to you know, concepts such as fairness, justice, equality, and where does one stand in relation to this rule and how can others hold one accountable for the position they take to it? So this is the idea of like, what do you put your agency behind and really take responsibility for it? So not just agency in the sense of you can make your own choice, make your own decision and take action without the interference or intervention of others, but committing yourself to certain rules and certain laws that um, I can defend um, when others ask me to justify my actions or justify my beliefs. Finally, I would like to share the contemporary education framework that is a framework meant for the project-based learning that starts from common themes that are related to human needs that then generate real-world activities to meet those needs. But looking at those real-world activities through the lens of multiple practices, multiple ways that human beings engage in those real-world activities across time and throughout cultures, and how those actions and practices are based in beliefs and concepts and theories. So there's an inquiry into what are the theories that sustain those different practices, and then a deliberation between those theories and those practices to create this reflection and this critical stance towards thoughts and actions to be more agentive and to be more uh, informed, intentional, and meaningful. So if you find this content interesting, please check out other videos on the Contemporary Education YouTube channel, follow on Instagram and Facebook, and check out the website at www.contemporaryeducation.com.